So in my last video, I told you guys I was going to show you how I made my back sauce. So today I'm going to show you how I make my back sauce. A year ago, I decided that I wanted to make myself a set of back saws, a carcass saw and a dovetail saw. And I thought in order to do it, I had to order all the goodies from all different suppliers so that I could put it together. I ordered myself some uh, shim stock. I got that from Lion Industries. And I'll leave links to all the, the companies that I ordered from so you guys can try it out for yourself. Um, this was a 1095 tempered shim stock and it comes blued. So I had to use a gun uh, bluing remover to take that off. You can sand it down, but that takes a little bit longer. And I ordered the saw nuts. There's a few different people that you can get those from. And I thought that I had to have the, uh, the pilot hole bits for drilling the holes for the nuts. And I thought that I had to have all this stuff. And I ordered it all and I was sitting around waiting for it and I got impatient. And one day I was walking through an antique store and I saw an old Buck Brothers saw hanging on the wall. And I thought, well, why can't I just take that home, rip it apart, use some of the parts, and, you know, practice, play around with it. So I took it home, and I, I popped the blade out, and the blade, you know, it looked all pitted and rusty and nasty. And after a little bit of sanding, it didn't turn out too bad. I popped the back off, sanded it up as well. I took the nuts out, and I, I took the handle off, and I just hung the handle on my, my cabinet. And I started thinking about what did I want, what I wanted it to look like, and I, I couldn't figure it out. And, and then one day I was thinking, well, I want, I want to make a carcass saw. And I thought, well, a carcass saw, that sounds kind of primal. It sounds like a you know, butcher shop. And I thought, well, what about like a Civil War uh, field bone saw for amputation? Huh, it just sounds mean. So I looked at some of the pictures of those things, and, and they had this just... Uh, really gothic primal look to them and that's how i came about with the scalloping and the horn on the front i want i kind of modeled mine after that and I, they look like they'll they'll cut and they do they work good um so in my impatience waiting for all my parts and it, it just dawned on me that i can make a back out of wood i could have reused the the back but uh, i gotta you know anything worth doing is worth overdoing <laughs> so I, uh, I had a slitter, uh, a slitting saw blade thing, and I put this in the, the drill press, and I, you got to make sure to have it like on the lowest setting, otherwise it'll burn up the teeth and burn up the wood. And I cut out some shapes that I liked, and then I just ran them through and put a slit right down the middle. So today I'll show you guys how I, how I do the wood back, and uh, that's really fun. The two saws I'll be working on are, are both going to get a brass back, but I'll show you how I make the wood back. Um, so let's get started. So the first thing I do when I'm making my saws is I will draw up a design of what I want it to look like, and from that I will make a pattern for the handle and for the blade. I will trace out on a piece of paper and then cut it out and trace it out onto the shim stock what I want the blade to look like. And then I will cut it out with a uh, Dremel cutoff tool. And th this is one place I will definitely say don't skimp on safety because those little pieces of metal, if they get in your eyes, they'll be irritating you for weeks and they're a pain in the butt. So definitely wear goggles when you do that. Um, if you can hook up a straight edge, I've seen on another guy's site that he, he used a straight edge kind of mechanism that he added to the end of the Dremel. That was a really clever way to go. I just do it freehand, which is kind of crazy and risky, but I've been lucky so far. Um, on the handles, uh, Blackburn Tools has some great uh, printable handle designs, different sizes, whatever, you know, different kinds of saws. For me, I used that kind of as a starting point, and then I went through and I made a variety of saw handles, and I tested them all out for fit to see which one, what was comfortable for me. And let's see, what else? Um, right now, the one saw that I'm going to be making today is uh, has an extra small handle. So I really am not going to be able to test that for comfort too much for me. It's for somebody else that you might see it on his uh, channel eventually. Um, so that's cool. Uh, but it's extra small. And I did use a Blackburn uh, pattern for that. And then I kind of took license with it and made my own uh, design. So, uh, let's get started cutting out the blade. Uh, so, before I get started on the, cutting this blade out, 
I had to show you my shock assistant, how lazy this one is. It's not really scientific, but to get kind of a straight cut, I will use the plywood that I have underneath of it. And I'll rest my uh, middle finger against that and I use that kind of like a straight edge to pull against. Uh, I, I go back and I joint the metal after I do the cut anyway. I mean, it, it leaves it kind of ragged, but then just take a, uh, a metal file and, and join it down and it, it works pretty good. Um, that side is gonna be in the the brass so it's not critical that it's dead perfect i'm going to use the the factory edge for the teeth um, and that seems to work really good uh, once i have the shape cut out i i will go back through and i i like to put in the horn design on the front and that way i'll know how long and to cut my brass too i don't know if you can see it on this but this plate kind of sat around for a while and i think it got a little rust damage right there. One of the, uh, the fun things about living on the Oregon coast is there's a really uh, large amount of water. <laughs> uh, so what I'm gonna do, I'll take a little artistic license there and I will cut that off. And I'll kind of bow out the front and I'll put in my horn right there. And I'll give it that look. I don't know if you can see that really well. Yeah. And then I'll, on the back, I like to angle that so that it fits onto the saw nicely. So let's see if I can get this in here. Um, so I'll figure out kind of where that is going to go. And I'll cut a little bit of an angle right there. Not really scientific. And then to kind of match the front, how it bevels in, I will come back and I'll bevel the back in a little bit. Like that, I'll cut those out. Here we go.
So when you're going to put the blade into the handle, um, there's a lot of different ways that you can do it. You can have a block that lifts a saw up to the height that it needs to be for, to be dead on center, and then you can rake the handle against it like that. Um, I, I, I do that to get it started, but then I just put it in the vise and, and uh, cut it freehand and it seems to work out okay. So now that I have the mortise done for, that receives the, the back, the brass back, and the slit is cut for the blade, um, I got it all set right where I want it to go. Now I'm going to use this uh, the cobalt uh, for drill bit for drilling through hardened steel. It's a uh, 5 30 seconds. It's just a, just a hair smaller than the post. So when I get it in there, it's going to hold it in really good. And uh, that, that'll be the pilot hole, and then I can come back with a Forstner bit on either side and drill out the the openings for, that receive the, the medallion and the other ends of the, the nuts. see this the inside of the post has a square shoulder that needs to be mortised out to drop down into the handle to fit down in there all the way so I mortise out the square inside the hole and that way they can drop in them both both the large and the small have that square on there in making your saw there's a lot of different places to get hardware from you can reuse old saw nuts from an old antique saw, a good one or a cheap one. It all depends on what you, what you want to use it for. Um, some of the old distance and warranted saws have these nice medallion nuts that are kind of neat. And if you want to make a, a new saw with a showy thing like that, you can buy a new medallion nut and it just has a recess in there. And uh, for some of my older saws, I, I, <laughs> I used my wife's precious metal clay. You can see this one turned out pretty good. But uh, it was, it's just a, like a clay that you uh, press into a mold. And I had these, uh, these presses laser engraved with my logo on them that I pressed into the clay. And then you fire it and it turns out like that. And then you can slip it in there. I had difficulty with, you know, getting the sizes right. So finally I had these uh, little coins laser engraved by a local laser guy. And those turned out really neat. I like those. So that's what I use now. There's uh, different styles of nuts that you can, that you can use a flat face like that, or there's a truncated face where it's actually raised above the, the work. This is a saw that's uh, in progress right now. One that I, uh, had what I found this piece of uh, driftwood it's petrified driftwood that I found on the beach that I turned into a little uh, cabochon put in there and uh, I'm gonna I plan to use that and uh, saw it in the future so on the backs here, here's an example of the, the wooden back as well as this one here so the wooden back uh, I make them about the same as the uh, the brass backs so here's the brass so they're about the same thickness, maybe a little bit thicker. And you want to use uh, a really straight grained, really really tough wood, something that's not going to flex and move too much on you. And uh, so I'll use this piece of walnut as an example. Once I get the piece uh, thickness that I, the thickness I want, and I get, get it all dimensioned and uh, I have a nice straight grain piece, then I can bring it over here to the drill press. And this, this slitting arbor, saw is it is a saw blade so if you're going to use something like this you want to be extremely careful uh, build yourself a jig or, or whatever you have to do to prevent it from uh, cutting you while you're trying to do this and i just rake it in there slowly um, until i get down to the full depth
then I'll take it over to uh, the scroll saw or band saw and I will cut out the scallops and the profile that I want and then I can put it on the, the saw. So now I got that, that square shoulder mortised out and I've got the nuts dropped down in there. It looks like I gotta adjust the depth of the holes onto them just a just a little bit. Um, if they go too deep, you can put a washer underneath of it and, and raise it out. But uh, it fits in there pretty nice and it looks looks like it'll work. I'm gonna cut a little detail down here on the end of the brass, and then I'm gonna run then uh, run it over a router with a carbide bit in there to give it just a little chamfer on the edge of the brass and then uh, it'll be ready to finish the handle and sand it all up and send it on its way. So my handle's done. I got it finished and I put uh, four coats of clear uh, lacquer finish on it. I put some lamb's tongue detail on there. It uh, turned out great. It's ready to go. The, the brass back is all shined up and shaped. It's ready to go. The steel plate has uh, been polished down to about 1500 grit using wet dry sandpaper. And I'm ready to uh, cut, cut in the teeth. And to do that, I use my saw vise that I made. It has a wooden hinge and a wooden screw. And I lined the jaws with uh, blue painter's tape to keep the filings from falling down in there and, and marring the side of the plate and to help on that end I also use it's a, a clear plastic drawer liner material and I use this for lots of different projects I have my zero clearance inserts that I use on my table saw that have the flames on them I use that uh, this as a template for uh, spraying the paint on that I also use this for uh, etching glass sometimes but I'll take a piece of that and I'll line the plate with it and that helps to keep it from getting marred and scratched up protects it while while I'm cutting in the teeth and to cut in the teeth there's a few different ways that you can do it you can use an old back saw that has a, the number of teeth per inch that you want to use um, and just put it right alongside of it or uh, a hacksaw blade if, if you can find one that has the same teeth per inch that you want to use a metal rule would work if you can you know if it, if it works out good and has the fine markings that you need um, and like I said, with the handles, the Blackburn tools, they have these great printouts that'll get you started for cutting out the handles. They also have printouts for um, teeth geometry, for how many teeth per inch you want to have, which I guess I should talk about that. I mean, there's, there's lots of really good uh, back saw makers on the market, some really high-end good stuff. And some of them are really expensive, some of them are, you know, affordable. All well worth the money. This is just a lot of fun. This is a fun project to do for my shop. And, and if you want to try it, I want to kind of make this video a one-stop shop. So I'm going to leave lots of links to um, you know, books and magazines and uh, videos, other sites, videos on YouTube that will help you along the way in making uh, your saw. But I, I'll go kind of briefly over what, what all is needed for setting in your teeth. So the first thing is the, the points per inch or teeth per inch. It's basically the same thing. It's talking about how many teeth you have on your saw blade per inch. Um, the points per inch, if you think about it like a mountain range, the points per inch is going to be the very tips of the mountains. And that's how you'll count them. The teeth per inch is going to be the whole mountain, the whole tooth. So you will take into how many whole teeth there are in that inch. So usually points per inch versus teeth per inch, there's one more. Um, because you're you're getting just the tip of the point in there. 
Uh, so that's that explains that. The next would be the rake. This is the file that I use, and it has a set screw in the bottom, but the file just pokes in here. It's a removable, and uh, so the rake is the the way that you orient the the file. Use a big file so you can see. Um, orient the face of the tooth to the work that you're doing. Orient the file this way. So straight up and down, perpendicular to the saw plate would be a zero degree rake. The further you go backward is going to be a, a positive rake of uh, zero to maybe 10 degrees for a rip saw, 10 to 15 degrees for a crosscut saw. You can get uh, the, the further back you go, the easier it is to start the cut, the smoother the cut's going to go, but the slower the cut's going to go. It's not going to cut as much material away. The, the less rake you have, zero, and you can even go into a negative rake, but the less um, rake you have, the more material you're going to remove, the faster it's going to cut, the harder it's going to be to start, and it's going to be not as smooth as... A, looking the walls of the cut won't be as smooth looking the fleam the fleam is going to be the the way that you orient the file this way so what that does is it produces a knife edge kind of like the the end of a, you know, an exacto blade has that that bevel that's that's going to be the knife edge and it's going to go out to one side that's going to help you sever the fibers of the wood so for a rip saw you don't need much of that at all zero <coughs> to maybe 10 degree fleam that's what i use this little piece of brass for i'll set that to my angle and i will just keep this running parallel with the saw plate as i file so uh, for a cross cut saw you, you're going to be severing the fibers of the wood and they're a little tougher so you're going to want with a hardwood you're going to want like 15 eh, 20 degrees of the fleam and then a soft wood, like a pine, it the fibers are looser, harder to cut through. So you want uh, more of that fleam. So 20, 25 degrees. You don't want to go too far because it'll make the the that uh, tooth really thin and and it won't last as long. So then the last thing is the slope. The slope is the direction you hold the file this way, and that produces a valley at the bottom of the tooth called the gullet that helps expel material as you're cutting through it. Whether you're buying a new saw, restoring an antique, or building your own from scratch, a well-tuned back saw is an invaluable part of a woodworking toolbox. It's important to know how to sharpen the teeth, recut them if you have to, how to use the saw and take care of it, and it's a lot of fun and a good project to build your own from scratch. I hope this video was an inspiration to you guys to go out and try something new, maybe make your own. And to have fun with it. Have fun with the shape and the design. It's a fun project, and I hope you enjoyed this video. Thanks for watching. Bye.
Medicine doesn't taste good, and safety isn't pretty. Deal with it.